Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Token Post interview. I am here joined by Mr. James Rodecki, the Global Head of Business Development at Cumberland. Welcome, sir. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. So starting off, Cumberland, or DRW, handles with OTC trading as well as large volume block trades. So would you care to briefly introduce what Cumberland does? Sure. Um, we uh, Cumberland is the cryptocurrency arm of DRW. Uh, DRW is a principal trading firm started in Chicago almost 27 years ago by a gentleman named Donald R. Wilson, hence the DRW. That was his trading badge on the trading floor and when he and, uh, and a few of his uh, colleagues got together to start a firm to trade euro dollar options on the mercantile exchange floor. And then over 20, uh, 26 years of, of capital markets evolution, DRW evolved with it and today we're a, a little firm of about a thousand employees in uh, about 13 offices around the globe, and uh, and uh, we trade principally in most asset classes and strategies around the world where there are liquidity and volatility. Um, and uh, but continuing with that evolution, DRW evolved in other ways with it. So additionally, um, to take to take advantage of. Um, dislocations in real estate prices. We launched a commercial real estate business called DRW Convexity Properties um, to, to take advantage of opportunities in the emerging fintech world. We launched a uh, business called DRW Venture Capital. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and to date, we've made uh, a, a large number of investments throughout the fintech and, and digital asset industries. And then um, we eventually got into uh, cryptocurrency and Cumberland is the cryptocurrency arm of DRW. Mm -hmm. So today Cumberland is um, the, largest, uh, the largest trader of cryptocurrencies in the ecosystem. Uh, we trade principally only, no agency, we're not in an exchange. Um, we have no outside investors. Uh, we don't do any custody, any advisory, or any agency brokerage services. We are a principal trader. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we do, we are one of the largest principal traders. We provide over the counter liquidity as well as trading on screens. We trade 24 hours a day, seven days a week from offices in Chicago, London, uh, and Singapore. And um, our calling card is that we're known for the liquidity that we can provide, and we're the biggest not only in the depth of markets that we can make in providing size. Um, quotes, but also in the breadth, the number of names that we trade. Um, we take our trading very seriously at DRW. But in addition to that, we also do run an opportunities desk out of DRW um, in conjunction with DRW VC, where we do make um, strategic investments throughout the ecosystem. The first of those investments was our, um, uh, it, our we co-founded Digital Asset Holdings in 2014, where we hired Blythe Masters from JP Morgan to uh, be the CEO to provide financial I'm sorry, blockchain solutions to the financial sector. Mm -hmm. um, we were the original. Uh, we were the original VC behind Bitfury, and most recently, we took a stake in Custodian Bitgo. We're very active throughout the ecosystem in more ways than just um, providing liquidity. So now, a lot of uh, project or the leaders of the industry presume 2019 to be something of a year of adopt. Presume the year of 19 to be a year of adoption. So, do you agree on that comment? Uh, I think what we've seen is we saw in 2017 an inflection point mm. where uh, years of education in both blockchain and cryptocurrencies happened to meet um, with venture capital at the perfect time where it lit the wick um, of exuberance into um, the evolution of cryptocurrencies. But as you know, it was a nascent asset class. It was under 10 years old at that point in time, and the infrastructure hadn't been built out. And we started seeing things that were um, maybe not consistent with long-term sustainability. Um, it's the only asset class we've ever seen where the operational risks are greater than the market risk. We've never seen an asset class like that in our time in the industry. And we thought this is, it's maybe um, a, little, uh, a little frothy, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's also, it, 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 so we, we took a step back and said, um, this is where we really started monitoring the institutionalization curve to say, how fast can institution, institutions come based on what they typically need conditions to invest in? Um, so what we saw in 2017 was, we thought we'd move from crypto 1.0 into crypto 2.0, a little bit more maturity at some point in time. And we saw that between Thanksgiving, uh, late November and December 18th of 2017, we saw we crossed that plane. And then what happened is a lot of people came running at the ecosystem. You saw a lot of smart price makers come in to provide liquidity and everyone expected the institutional money to come in and go right into the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And we didn't suspect that, that that is how it would play out and that is not how it's played out. The investment from more in, from the institutional side went into 
investment in the infrastructure around the ecosystem to account for the inputs of things that they needed to be more stable in the ecosystem. And what happens then, what you get is price consolidation and decrease mm -hmm. in volatility. And so it's been a very uncomfortable time uh, in two, 2018. It's all day in the reverse, right? <laughs> well, people thought 2018 would be that adoption and it really wasn't going to be. It had to be where we started the work on finishing the job. Mm -hmm. And so 2018 became where people were building and you saw a lot of service providers build up and they were coming in and with firms like us, we said, okay, we're going to eventually see contraction in these markets. Let's deploy our resources where we can take advantage of that as opposed to trying to keep up with everybody else. So we really sunk into our own, um, our own resources and said, what will people need in crypto 3.0 to make money? How, what will institutionalization look like? Um, you know, how much should we be selling versus refining our own product and infrastructure? And that's where we spent our time. Now, we, we think we'll see continuing consolidation through 2019, and then we'll start to see how the adoption can start implementing from there. But uh, I'm, yeah, I suspect that uh, the next couple of quarters, we could continue to see consolidation as opposed to adoption. But there is a lot of work being done by a lot of smart people and a lot of smart investing going into the ecosystem. So it's, uh, it's on its way. So 2019 was a harsh, 2018 was a harsh bear market for crypto projects right. all over the world. Now, has the operational decisions or the infrastructure has changed for 2019 due to the bear market of 2018? Yeah, I think it's caused pause in a lot in people. There were people that raced in um, that felt like they missed it and really raced in, assuming that the, 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 in, the institutional monies would race directly into the capital markets and be investable in cryptos. And um, because that didn't play out that way, there was a lot of uh, heavy hiring in the ecosystem, a lot of investing in, in, um, in people are expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of investing in expensive technologies that um, are probably not ready to be used yet. And so I think it, um, the back half, the fourth quarter of 2018 caused some pause. You started to see layoffs in pockets mm -hmm. in, in the uh, institution. I had a number of people ask me, um, you know, in December, is this the end? Um, you know, is it could it be? And I said, no. I mean, really, if you look at the, the the nascency of this of this asset class, it's actually really just the beginning. Because if the, in, in my analogy was, if this was a sporting event, the national anthem is just ending, the game's getting ready to begin. Mm -hmm. Because the smart investing into the infrastructure to support um, the 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 asset class is was just now starting to bake. This is the only asset class we've ever seen in our lifetime where the price action and the underlying outpaced the infrastructure build out to support it by years. Mm -hmm. So I w believe that um, there are good things coming. Um, we saw, uh, it, but it did change the way a lot of people um, that didn't have cause, that didn't have reason for cause before started to tap the brakes and say, you know, there's a non-zero risk that this could all not work and do all that, and, and that's correct. So it did change a lot, but what we believe is that the price action is really just a scorecard for trading, um, that it doesn't really price in um, the work that's being done in the movement, the ecosystem underneath it, and that work has not slowed. It's picked up pace. Um, and those that have really invested in, in this mentally and emotionally, that have studied the technology, are, are even really more in. And the truth of the matter is that that's how the way I feel. I mean, most days when my feet hit the floor, um, I, I, I wake up and I say, I wish I would have got up an hour earlier because I'm that committed to this space. I do believe in it. I believe good things are coming, but that doesn't necessarily play out in price action today. Now, it, it, it could be a personal question. No, if, if, you're, if you're uncomfortable, you don't have to answer it, but <laughs> do you personally get into uh, trading? Um, I've been an active investor since uh, late 2011, early 2012. Really, that yeah, early? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and I was I was blessed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I got lucky. Right. Now, bring the matter, bring the interview back to Cumberland. Mm -hmm. Now, Cumberland is a like you mentioned, is one of the largest OTC trading platforms. Mm -hmm. However, uh, contrary to its fame, it's relatively quiet within the industry. It's there's not much news around it. There's not much uh, perfor uh, well performance or uh, events surrounding it. So. What's your secret sauce behind the fame that you have achieved currently? I think what we've, what we've done is we're a mature firm. Cumberland was um, a startup within the DRW framework, mm -hmm. but DRW has been in business um, for almost 27 years. And so we were able to ride off the, um, the, the years of developing, of implementing and refining our development of our risk management practices and normal mm -hmm. business processes, internal controls, 
uh, and things of that nature. So we were able to um, move and adapt much more quickly than startups in the space because mm -hmm. we had so much more infrastructure and experience to rely on. So what we did in 2018 is rather than go out and try to sell everybody everything, what we did is focused on on where we thought the ecosystem was going and who we were going to, how we were going to be part of that ecosystem going forward. So we committed to the ecosystem. We committed to best practices. We committed to understanding what institutions will need um, as they come to the table in Crypto 3.0. So we invested all of our time in, in, in in rolling out, we've just are rolling out now our institutional offering, which is um, a suite of, of electronic trading um, platforms as opposed to the traditional, you know, Skype or, or voice trading in the ecosystem. We're rolling out institutional reporting with that research, things of this nature. Um, we're going to be looking a lot more like a, a Goldman Sachs um, <laughs> style business model than um, a typical crypto business mm -hmm. model for crypto 3.0. And principally, that that's what we know. But we have a very talented team um, of risk managers. Um, our technologists are second to none. Um, we have trading teams uh, in three cities, and we can pull from a roster of other traders in many offices and other strategies around the world. It's the depth of a, of a long tenured organization that really adds to um, Cumberland, even though we are really exclusively focused on the blockchain and crypto space. It's, mm -hmm. been, it's, been, it's a really nice combination. So dealing with multi-blockchain, large volume, uh, it's critical that the company keep track of the market and predict where it's going to go. So just to be straightforward, how do you keep track of the market? I think we, um, we focus on our counterparties first and foremost. I think that delivering the Cumberland experience, um, so we put in a relation man relationship management um, program that we run as part of our, of our offering so that you have 24 hour, seven a day a week um, access to relationship managers to help with these problems. And through that, we are able to um, both accrue information in on what are the changing needs of our counterparty base is, as well as we have the technology and infrastructure that's been developed starting 27 years ago mm -hmm. through to today, where we can, our systems allow us to, um, to warehouse risk that others possibly can't based on our modeling, but it also allows us to be very nimble in, in understanding what our counterparties' needs are to provide that experience to back to them. So the products that we'll be developing to allow them access to liquidity, to get them um, frictionless access to global liquidity where they can't get it without a, a connect, because they can't connect to 280 exchanges around the world, to seamless same-day settlement of their um, fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat, or crypto to crypto transactions because we are a global firm. Um, these are the things that um, it's very difficult for a startup to come in and they can compete any, at the spot market in some way, but can they scale it and repeat it? The, the difference is, is that we invested with a long-term greedy approach to saying we're going to invest in everything that we do. Is it going to be what we need out three, five, and seven years from now? Mm -hmm. And that's a difference of being an institution as opposed to a lot of the startups that we're saying we need to make money now. We invest for that. We, we take a long-term approach to this, and our systems reflect that. So we're able to translate um, intelligence back and forth between our counterparties uh, much more seamlessly than most in this space. Now, mentioning about your counterparties, the influx of institutional money or the institutional capital is what all crypto traders or crypto industry is waiting for. Now, there have been news on predicting future influx of these institutional capital. However, uh, would you care to comment on the specific timing or the, well, the trend among the institutional investors out there in the world? I, I try never to give my opinion on things because my opinion <laughs> and, and a dollar and a quarter won't get you on the bus in the city of Chicago, but I, I do share my experience. And we, we saw that um, a lot of people were um, deploying a strategy that the institutional money is coming, but we found that um, most of their um, thesis was based on hope. Mm -hmm. um, they knew that um, that will be the velocity of money that could carry this to the next level. We took a different approach, um, more of a systematic uh, and, and data-driven approach. And so we, um, I wrote a paper a while back, and, and Justin Chow, um, who's our Asia head of business development, helped me refine this. But we start, we ran a model um, that where we can take the qualitative information of the inputs that we believe will drive that institutional money, the institutionalization, we call it, into the space. And um, there's a series of inputs that we monitor on, on a regular basis and run our own internal index to see how we should be speeding up 
certain resources and pulling back on others based on how the circumstances in the ecosystem impact the, the institution's sentiment to get in. And I'll touch on them briefly for you, but the first is, is liquidity. Of course, um, of course. Liquidity, access to liquidity is challenging in the crypto space. You have 280 some odd exchanges today, yes. 200 more preparing to roll out in the next uh, two quarters. And uh, that doesn't count the decentralized exchanges. And the, the liquidity is generally bifurcated across these exchanges. Well, institutions typically need bigger size and access to that liquidity, but they can't connect to 200 exchanges to get it. So mm -hmm. for that reason, firms like us at Cumberland, we've taken us uh, able to maintain a dominant role in that because they can come to us and we can trade the size they want at a price and settle same day when other people can't necessarily do that. So the bifurcated market structure is it will be a remain um, a barrier to entry for institutions. The second is settlement. Fiat is slow. Um, yes. If we sit in Chicago and we do a, a principal transaction with a counterparty in Australia, um, if I really had to get that money to Australia, the best way to me to get to get somebody that really needed money in Australia is to go to the ATM, take as much cash out as I can, get on a plane, fly to Australia, and I'll be, I could beat the wire transfer by a day. Mm -hmm. um, that's still slow, so we need to work on that because we can move coins generally in 10 minutes across the Bitcoin blockchain. Yes. The other thing is that the traditional capital markets where Wall Street is really good is they perfected the mechanics behind lending, repo markets. So you see that they have a repo market that sets rates and they have lending mechanisms that allow for accessibility and clawback of collateral. To date, all the lending mechanisms in crypto are bilateral. So as these mechanisms mature, we'll get more velocity through the system, but it's definitely um, a barrier for the institutions because they need to move size money quickly and, that, and we're still a little nascent in this. Mm -hmm. The third is custody and security. Only asset class we've ever seen in our lifetime where the operational risks outweigh the market risk. Bitcoin can't go to zero today. Your wallet can. That scares institutions. Mm -hmm. But there's also the concept of a qualified custodian. Um, in the United States, in, in uh, I believe the UK, where the common law regulation, asset management firms over a certain size are required to have a qualified custodian. So yeah. there's regulatory issues that need to be addressed in order to get people to get into these custodians, um, both from a, a custody and security side as well as a regulatory side. We still need things like FASB has yet to come out and issue um, statements on accounting um, gap accounting and taxation, and these things need to be addressed, and then that custody and security will, will address. The custody and security side, the technologies are advancing very quickly. It's, a lot of it's the regulatory and the confidence side. The fourth I input is uh, valuation and, and research. Mm -hmm. um, we're raised, we, in high school, we start learning about balance sheets and income statements and earnings reports. Remember those days. We're <laughs> used to all the fundamental analyses. You know, we can look at supply chain. It's a very different set of fundamentals that you mm -hmm. would need to really understand how you're, you're in, in, there's some intangibles in here in the technology. As we start to see adoption and we see what works and we see a floption, things where they're going away and going to zero, we'll start getting a better definition of how to um, value these um, technologies and projects. And then you'll start to see a standardization of research and traditional people can grab onto that in ways that they're used to investing with research. Mm -hmm. um, it's been challenging to date. A lot of time and money being spent into valuation mechanics and in one year we've come a long way. The final input, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's the uncertainty around regulation. Mm -hmm. um, it's most in traditional asset classes, the asset class that's being regulated is regulated by the country's rules, um, their local regulation, and they look to the West, to the SEC and the CFTC in the United States. This is an asset that truly 7.5 billion people in the world on six continents can trade. It's very difficult, very difficult and challenging to harmonize a regulation for something that is truly global. Mm -hmm. We could have in the future security tokens that trade in the United States and in Singapore at the same time. Who? How do you regulate something <laughs> like that? So um, I think the regulators are trying to do a really good job. They've been thoughtful in, in many jurisdictions about not being too heavy handed to slow the innovation, but we, we have work to go there. And then the final input is adoption. Um, that what will really bring the institutions in, I believe, over the other inputs is if we start seeing adoptable use cases where you can actually use this as a currency with speed, um, that will is probably the spark that will move the institutional money in quicker. And um, 
there's a lot of work being done uh, and some of the, the the overlays to the standard protocols. Lightning is one that everyone's watching very quickly on mm -hmm. top of Bitcoin. Bitcoin Cash is, is getting a lot more. They have some challenges yet, but they're, they're becoming a lot more prolific. And then a number of the other new protocols, as they're getting ready to roll out their new um, their new t live nets, well, they're moving out of testing. Yeah, yeah and, and so I think that we'll see a lot of um, new innovation in 2018 that will spur that, uh, or 2019, but we, We'll see how that plays out on the back half of 19 into 2020. Wonderful comment. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. That was Mr. James Rudecki, the global head of business development at Cumberland.